Great. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, glad you could join us. We're I'm very excited about this presentation from Morgan. Um, just a quick introduction. My name um, is Jessica Rano. Oh, sorry, I'm tagged, I've tagged myself as my dear here. Um, I'm a clinical social worker, the associate clinical director at my dear. And Morgan, I'll let Morgan introduce herself and give her a little story. Um, but we have a presentation today really about all things screen time um, and a really interesting and in-depth look at how we think about kids and screen time. Um, and Morgan, I'm just going to let you take it away. We're actually, after this presentation, Morgan has a number of resources that we're going to make sure we share out. Um, I have a link I will share in the chat uh, where you can access some things Morgan has put together. Um, all right, Morgan, go ahead, get us started. Great. Thank you. I am excited. This is my most favorite topic to, to talk about. And so I'm excited to, to dive in today. So to quickly go over what we're going to uh, be talking about, we'll talk about what's considered high quality digital media experiences for children. We'll talk about the roots of conflict when it comes to devices and the way in which caregivers play a role in their children's media habits. I will share tangible tips and takeaways to help you build routines and, and find balance. And then we'll also discuss MITRE as a digital tool and have a quick Q&A. Throughout this webinar, I will bring in strategies that I share in my book. Uh, it's a children's chapter book for grades two to five, but it, it really can expand based on if you make it a read aloud. Um, and so we will at the end share the full curriculum for free and uh, the first five chapters and a couple of one pagers and resources as well. Um, as a note, this webinar is directed for caregivers who have children anywhere from preschool through middle school. We know that they will those have widely different media choices. Um, the one thing we will not be specifically covering is social media. It's kind of a, a whole different beast. Um, but if there's interest, we we will discuss at a future date. Um, and while that is a pretty big age uh, kind of range of ages. Uh, you know, if you have, if you're a parent of a younger child, you are usually picking out the content. And if you have older children, they're picking out the content. But these strategies and the principles that we'll discuss today uh, are something that you can talk with your youngest children to your oldest children about. And as a final note, before we get started, uh, it would be helpful to have a place where you can scribble down a couple of notes, whether that's a digital tool, a notepad, the back of an envelope, or a note-taking app. I recommend grabbing something to write down a few a few notes in. All right, so a little bit about me in pictures. I taught elementary school and middle school, and then I became an instructional coach for teachers. And during this time, I, I read a quote that said, kids spend more time on devices than they do at school. So they're on their devices more than they are at school. And that was a huge light bulb moment for me. I thought, there's such tremendous potential for devices, but also a, a deluge of problems that come with that potential. And so I just became fascinated by the question and, and still very much am, you know, how do we ensure that our children are having high quality digital media experiences? And, and what is high quality? So I spent a year reading research about digital media use, and I realized so much incredible evidence-based tips are locked behind scientific journal paywalls. And so they never really make it into families' hands. And I wanted to help make the research more mainstream and equip families with really great strategies that empower them to use devices in a healthy way and also prevent families from feeling powerless. And so I wrote a children's chapter book that you can see here called The Mediators. And the goal was to do just that, uh, to deliver research-based tips using a fun, positive, and, and productive approach. I got my master's in child development focusing on technology and media, under, trying to understand what's going on from a developmental standpoint when children are engaging with technology. And now I work for uh, digital media companies as a writer and a learning designer, thinking about how can kids best learn from devices? So that is um, a little bit about me. Before we get into the content, there are two foundational views that will frame how we engage this topic. And the first one is that devices are tools, like scissors, 
or knives, they're tools that can be helpful and they can be harmful. And that depends on, on who is using them and how they are being used. We don't hand scissors to a four-year-old for the first time and hope they'll figure it out. We gradually teach them over time. And devices are the same way. There's one of my, my least favorite phrases is called a digital native. And it's a term you might have heard uh, where we refer to children who grew up with technology in their lives from the get-go. And the problem with that, set, that statement is that it doesn't it doesn't mean that just because they've grown up with it, they innately know how it works. Uh, just because a toddler looks at a cell phone and it lights up and they can press it or hold a phone to their ears, that's not something that they were born with. That is something that they they modeled after, you know, after they saw it being done. And so, you know, we we still have to teach children how to use devices. If you're thinking, okay, my kid's 12, like ship has sailed, like they're too old now. Uh, you know, it's really not true. We are constantly learning and relearning and we can redefine our relationship with devices at any standpoint. And the next kind of foundational view is the phrase, it depends. In, in the child development field, the most common answer to any question is, it depends which is incredibly frustrating as a parent to hear when you're ask, you know, getting at, or asking questions about your child, but it depends is a fitting answer for many questions. Is this TV show okay for them to watch? Is YouTube bad? Are tablets better than TVs? What age should they get a cell phone? We want concrete black and white answers, but with digital media, the answer is that it depends most of the time. So this webinar is not going to create hard and fast rules, routines, and media recommendations that you have to follow. Unfortunately and fortunately, there's no rule book that exists. But thankfully, there are a lot of great research and evidence-based tips that can guide you on how to answer these questions for yourself in a way that, that best fits your family and your family's needs. All right. So... One of the reasons that this topic is, is so fraught and complicated is that screen time is an overwhelming concept. So much of our lives revolves around devices. It's hard to set boundaries, establish and keep routines. And it's also hard to differentiate between activities that we're doing on our devices. So the goal is to start there. We're gonna start by unpacking screen time and what screen time looks like in your family. This is one of my, my favorite ways to think about screen time. It's called the three C's by Lisa Guernsey, who's um, an excellent researcher in this field. Uh, the first C that, so the, the three C's is a, a way to think about your child's relationship to their devices and how to ensure they are having balanced, high quality media experiences. First content is C. Uh, C, sorry, the first C is content. Uh, this means what you are doing on your device. The show you're watching, the game your kid is playing, the book that you're reading, podcast you're listening to, platform they're building or designing on, social media app you're scrolling through, all of that is content. So to start, we're going to take inventory of what your family does on devices. It's helpful to break it down in stages. What device you're using, what type of media you're engaging with, and then what specific platform or product you're on. So for example, laptop, I'm using a laptop, I'm playing a video game, it's Minecraft. I'm on my phone, I'm doing an educational app, it's Duolingo. I'm on my phone, I'm texting, it's iMessage. Now you don't have to go through and, and do these three steps for all of the media you engage with, but it is just a, a helpful way to think about what type of content you're using. So go ahead and, and maybe make a list of the top 10 uh, different content you're engaging with and then do the same for your child. I'll give you about 30 seconds, not a lot of time. <laughs> we have a lot of content to cover, but I'll give you a little bit of time to start just jotting down different content that both you engage with and then also write down for your child or children. All right, we will 
you can kind of keep writing uh, as I know there's a lot. It would take me much more than 30 seconds to write down all of the different types of content. Uh, you can kind of keep going as I move on to the next slide. Uh, not all media are created equal. This is why the term screen time isn't very helpful. The activities that you do on your device wildly differ in their, in their benefits, their impact, their effects, in their quality and the value and purpose they serve. So lumping them all together is not, it's not very helpful. It's quite problematic. If the goal is to create a healthy balance and have high quality digital media experiences, then what I like to do is, is to sort screen time activities into a few categories, which is what you're gonna do with the list that you created. Activities you can do openly, activities you can do often, activities you could do occasionally, and then activities you should limit. Now, mind you that everyone's media pyramid will look different. They are, there are some general guidelines that we will talk through, but it should be individualized. So this is an illustration from my book. To go through a couple, we have openly video chat, music, podcasts, often educational TV, uh, if we're watching content with others or doing an active game, occasionally doing things on your devices alone, um, single player games, passive games, just general browsing of the internet, and then limit media during meals, media before bed, violent video games, long time without a break. So this is kind of the general media pyramid. And similar to food, there are certain activities that are more healthy or good for you than others. And it doesn't mean we can't have that slice of chocolate cake. I love chocolate cake, um, but we should be mindful that if we eat chocolate cake every single day for every single meal, that's not very healthy. And the same goes for healthy choices. If you only ate broccoli every single meal, that also would be a problem. And so we're kind of going for a balance here and, and thinking about the different activities we use. Using this metaphor, like food, of talking about content and healthy choices and balancing your media diet is a really helpful way to explain media balance to kids. So one of the, the worksheets or the activities that you can do in the curriculum, which we'll briefly do now, is to take the media you wrote down for both yourself or for your child and try to sort it into openly, often, occasionally, and limit. I'll give you again about 30 seconds to take a few and, and sort those. Morgan, this is really, this is really interesting. I'm doing this for myself. And even in this, for myself, I haven't even gotten to my children yet, but the, dis, the where something should be versus where it is in my life is, it's very interesting to sort of see that laid out, um, makes it very clear. I'm I'm curious when we add in this third layer, which we'll do in a second, where, where that'll make it fall for you. But yeah, I think, you know, we, we focus on food for balance so much, you know, I think we've kind of gotten that down, whether or not you do it different, but I think it's a, it's an easier thing to understand. And for media that, that piece often gets missed. It's just all devices, but it's, it's so different, you know? And so I think, um, yeah, I think this is hopefully, hopefully a helpful way to start to break it down. So, you know, I think this, this is something you can do with your children together. This is a great activity to start from a positive and productive place of just creating this basic pyramid and, and discussing where pieces fall. And wait a minute, that fell in a different place than mine, than yours. Why is that? Is that okay? Should we move it? Is it okay to stay in a different place? I think those conversations are, are so great when we talk about devices. A quick note about content. This is for me a really helpful way to think about you know, high quality content and what type of content we want, you know, our children on. Some content we call attention grabbing. Its goal is to suck you in and keep you there. And then we have another type of content that's attention building. And through your own interest and your actions, you continue to stay focused on it and build that muscle of focus to a task. 
We want attention building, not attention grabbing. I'm sure you can all think of something on your device that's attention grabbing, that just all of a sudden you find it's 20 minutes later and you have no idea what happened versus maybe when you're, if, you know, if you're at work or, you know, if you're answering email, you're focusing your attention, that's building attention. So when your child is on their device, they're on an app or, you know, they're doing something, ask yourself, who is driving the interactivity? Is the child driving the interactivity or is the tech driving the interactivity? And that simple question can really help you sort <laughs> sort your items into the pyramid quite quickly. One example is open-ended games. Sometimes they're called sandbox games. These games are great examples of, of attention building games. They require children to be interactive, to be engaged and, and show using their interests to stay engaged. Next up, we have setting intention. When your child, uh, when your children are using media, we want them to understand why they are choosing to be on their device. We want to avoid situations where they are just mindlessly consuming content or they just default to picking up a device. So actually speaking out loud why you're using a device and the purpose it's serving is an incredibly powerful strategy. The disclaimer here being that it doesn't always have to be educational or it doesn't have to always be centered around a learning goal. You know, we all have watched the occasional reality TV show and sometimes that's just what we needed. We needed a break. We wanted to laugh or we wanted to see some drama and that's okay. But, you know, setting that intention and knowing why you're engaging with that content is really helpful because that also helps you sort it into your media pyramid. And so, Having, having children articulate their intention or their purpose for using their device is actually, it's a critical media literacy skill that you'll start to see in more media literacy curriculums. Um, again, it's, it's okay to have chocolate cake, but understanding that it is chocolate cake is really, is really helpful. Here are some reasons, some, some reasons you'd use your device. I'm using my device to communicate, to help me complete a task, to learn, to work, to laugh, to communicate, connect with others, to document something, to be more efficient, explore, play, take a break, have fun, create, spread awareness. There are so many different reasons that we can use our device, but being able to articulate that as adults and as children is really, is really helpful. And so this, this brings us to our, our third, uh, sorry, second C, which is context. This involves where, when, and with who you are using the device. Are you consuming content alone with others? Are they using it in their room, at the dinner table, at a restaurant, during a conversation? Are you using it together as a family? Go back to your list of media activities and add some contextual details to it. Where do you usually do this? When is it with someone? Give you 30 seconds to just take a couple and add some context to a typical use of that. So long live the TV room. Uh, this <laughs> used to be that there was a computer room, right? There was a, a computer. It was stationary in a room, it was hooked up to the wall, and that was the internet. <laughs> and then the same went for a TV. You had, you know, a TV in a place. Now internet is everywhere, and devices continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller, which means that they get more personal and personal and less social in a way, right, around others. It, it, it does enable you to access content anywhere at any time, but you know, we ask ourselves just because it can be accessed anywhere, should it be? And this is precisely why it's so tricky as families to establish rules and routines because technology is so ubiquitous. It's very hard to set these strict, rigid guidelines when it's everywhere, all the time, always changing. Those, those are kind of conflicting against each other. And so this does go back to the idea of, of setting intention. <laughs> so because devices, you know, can be used anywhere, doesn't mean they should. We want to break that habit of just always having them out. 
or defaulting to using them just, you know, because when we set intention, it really helps us balance our media use. And so we want to provide context. When are we going to, with who, where, for how long? We want to add that context piece when we're thinking about using devices. So here's an example, you know, uh, having your family get in the, it'll feel weird at first. It'll feel like a very awkward thing, but having your family get in the practice of, of saying, you know, okay, I'm going to get on my tablet to see how old that actor is. You know, if you're discussing it at the dinner table, it's going to take me two minutes, you know, adding that simple time where you're saying, I'm going to be on it for this long, and then I'm going to be off it. It's, it's really helpful to add context to when you set intention. Morgan, right there. So are you talking about a little bit of like habit formation there? Yes. Like yeah. interrupt the, like the typical, I just picked up my, my phone. I didn't think about it and I'm just doing it. Like trying to train yourself a little bit to think about the, that moment, that action, yeah. the intention. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think it's so easy because it's everywhere to just grab it. Not really know why, but it's really, you can find yourself busy on it a second later. And it, it leads to this idea of boredom. Um, when thinking about the context in which we use devices, it's really natural instinct to whip it out while you're waiting in line. Uh, I've been trying to not do that lately while I'm waiting for the bus or while I'm, you know, I've been trying to not take it out um, to check a message the second that you hear the ding or you see the screen light up. Um, and the same goes for kids. It's really tempting not to get in a quick game um, to watch a quick video. And we often do this when we're feeling bored. But boredom is so good for us. It is, it boosts creativity, self-esteem. It improves our memory. It improves our ability to self-regulate. Uh, there are so many reasons. And there's one of my favorite books is about boredom. It's that boredom is brilliant. Boredom is incredible for us, but it's under attack, if I'm being honest, not to be too fear-mongering, but I do think boredom is under attack because devices are really good at curbing boredom. So note the times when your kids are bored and then what they do with that boredom. Is it just, and, and the same for you, what happens when we're bored? What do, what do we do with it? And maybe lean into boredom, get excited about boredom a little bit more. We're gonna talk about some roots of conflict with devices and some issues that come up when we, when we have you know, devices in our family ecosystem. Um, but you'll often see that the, it comes back to that they were bored, that it was whipped out because they were bored. Boredom is often at the root of a lot of uh, conflict where we, we did not set intention or purpose while we got on the devices and then we find ourselves in conflict. So the more intentional and proactive we can be about how devices are used, where they are used and when, it's going to make a huge difference in our lives. You know, we talk about, we talked a lot about setting intention, but also being proactive is a big piece of this. Devices often create conflict because we're trying to get our kids off devices, but doing as much as you can before proactively, um, I call it a DGP, a device game plan. Thinking about how long you'll be on your device, what you're going to do, what you're going to do after is the key piece because Children have a really hard time getting off, actually anyone, I shouldn't say children. We all have a really hard time. Even if we say, you know, we're gonna get off at this time. I mean, how many of us set, you know, the time limit apps that say, you know, you're, you've hit your limit and you just kind of exit out without even thinking about it. It's, it's hard to set those boundaries. So saying what you're gonna do after, giving, holding yourself accountable for that after activity that's not on a device, is a really helpful piece to really support that transitional moment. And so a device game plan, which one of the characters does in the book, really helps helps them think about, okay, what is what is the fun thing? What's something I'm looking forward to that that will pull me out after? This is this piece, Morgan, this trans, being proactive to help with the transition off is so relevant. We hear this all the time with families who are using I mean, screen time in general, media use in general for kids, but this question comes up with my dear as well because of it is with a screen, right? And so how do I help my child who also already struggles with frustration tolerance and struggles with transitions? Like these are things that they all have a more difficult time with anyway. How do I, so how do I help them 
get off of their device, get off of their screen. So this is great. This is really helpful information. And I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but in the media world, we call it a view and do strategy. So once you've viewed, and obviously it's a little bit mightier is more dynamic than just viewing because you are doing, but once you're on your screen, what, what do you do after that helps translate that from the screen to the real world? And I think mightier offers a lot of really, um, really easy moments of, you know, can you show me what calming activity you just did? You know, what, what coping strategy you just used? Um, can you, and, and that's just a short little activity. Let's do it in real life that you can do right after. Um, so view and do strategy is a helpful way um, that you can think about, okay, on device, what do we do now? How, and whether that's connecting it, you know, it's, we watched an Eleanor Wonders Why episode and they were outside exploring their backyard. Now let's go explore the backyard. Uh, it can connect to what you're doing on your device uh, or it can be just a different activity afterwards. So joint media engagement is a really great example of creating high quality media experiences. Anytime you're using devices with others, you're immediately going to kind of climb the pyramid, if you will. And that's because, you know, a lot of research has gone into what happens when you're using it together in person. And there's so much more communication, connection. It helps support children's learning from the device. And a lot of really cool research on supporting their mental well-being as well when you're using devices together. So the fancy term is joint media engagement. It really just means using devices together, talking about them, having positive experiences together using media. And so just wanted to shout it out as a really great way to increase, you know, to improve the quality, to, to make it healthier is when you're actually engaging in things together. Maybe that's taking turns, you know, on a mightier game. I'm sure the child won't want you to mess up their data, but I think there's just really easy moments of, can I see what you're doing? Can you teach me how? Having children be the expert in a device instead of, oh, the device is this forbidden fruit. And I, you know, it's nice to, to come into the conversation and to, to join them and play and learn from them and have them be the expert. And now we have our third C, which is child. Your child's disposition, their personality, their diagnoses, their preferences, their interests, they all influence how they choose media and how they're impacted by media. This is a really, really old quote. It's about 60 years old. Um, it's about children and television <laughs> and I think it's rings so true for all media. So I'm gonna read it for you now. For some children, under some circumstances, some television is harmful. For other children, under the same conditions, or for the same children under other conditions, it may be beneficial. For most children, under most conditions, most television is probably neither particularly harmful nor particularly beneficial. And I think what that sheds light on is that all of our kids are so different and all of us are so different. And so how we are affected by media, how we choose media looks different. And that's why blanket restrictions and routines and recommendations just don't work. At the end of the day, the caregivers are the experts in their children and tuning into that. I think we often lose our parent gut. You know, the amount of times I'll Google something and search it about my child instead of just asking myself, like, wait a minute what do, you know, what do I know about him and, and how, you know, why he's having this, this tantrum. And so I think that's really helpful to remind yourself that you're the expert in your child and they're the expert in themselves and talking about what works and what doesn't uh, is, is really important and beneficial. Um, there's a really great researcher, Katie Davis, she has a new book out and she says, set nuanced guidelines, not uniform restrictions. And that to me, it gives you a little bit of grace <laughs> as a caregiver. It also allows you to say, okay, for some children, some, some routines and, and you know, some things might be different and that's okay. Um, hopping now into roots of conflict, which you know, we're, we're gonna briefly touch on here and, and how to avoid drama with devices is one of the most frequent questions I, uh, or conversations that I encounter. Um, and obviously it depends is gonna be my answer to a lot of it. Um, but my my best advice to to find the is to find the root of the conflict and address the root issue instead of just focusing on the device itself. 
But I do know that sometimes um, it is about the device. <laughs> that is actually the, the conflict. And so I'm going to try to provide some more nuanced tips here as well for times when it is both, you know, how do we get to the root of the issue? And then how do we also tackle that device piece? So here are some common roots of conflict, and maybe some of these will, will hit home with you. Distraction, when someone isn't paying attention or focusing because they're on a device. We have sharing, when someone wants to share a device, but the other person doesn't want to. Frustration, which, you know, Jesse just talked about, when the device isn't working or, or someone loses a game or they can't figure something out and gets upset. Broken trust. When someone does something on their device, they aren't supposed to or uses it without permission and then struggle to stop, similar to something we just discussed when the, they're still using the device, but they were supposed to, to not use it. So here are a few strategies. This is very text heavy. I apologize about that, but um, to go through a couple. For distraction, thinking about the context of the situation is gonna be really helpful. Should the device, if, you know, if the root of conflict is distraction, should the device even be out? If it can be out and they can be playing it, then their distraction is actually focus. Now they're focusing on their task at hand. While that's not paying attention to you, they are building that skill of focus. And so we just have to be really explicit about you know, when devices are out and can be out and understand that they're, they are engaging with that and they're focused. And then putting them away and, and, you know, making sure that's a clear distinction. Cause sometimes we kind of live in the middle. They're always out, they're always around. And then the distraction piece is just that much harder. For sharing, uh, asking yourself, you know, who owns the device? Is it you? Is it the whole family? Is it them? Who can be on it? And are there more opportunities to do activities together on devices? Is it clear when you can have your own time on device, you know, making sure that that is, is set for, for kids. Frustration, I do recommend taking out the device piece. It's, it's usually not about the device and really addressing their frustration, validating their feelings and how they're feeling in the moment. Um, not just taking away, well, then you can't have the tablet because you're getting frustrated, right? That's going to escalate. And so really taking a second to not address the device and just address I can see you're really frustrated in this moment, just validating that that feeling because they're now at a point with their emotions where, you know, if we're just going to talk about the device, that's a heated topic. That's not going to be a productive conversation. And so we're moving from, from being discussed. Jess, were you going to say something? I want to. Yeah, well, I was going to wait till you finish. I can wait till you finish your lesson then. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, and then just the two others. We have broken trust. I think the big one is giving giving children a chance to rebuild the trust. What is the opportunity they have to rebuild it and how, and articulating that to them and saying like, I'm, I'm really excited for you to show me how you can rebuild trust with me and what that looks like. I think that gives, gives children the opportunity to, to start to repair that harm and struggle to stop. I really think device game plans, the more proactive you can be, the better. Obviously, you're not just going to throw a DGP in front of them and then life's good, no issues. I wish it were that simple and it's not. But the more that you can, you know, be a proactive just over time, it's not a magic bullet, but over time will continuously help you set boundaries and, and you know, they set boundaries. Um, so I will um, pause there because I know, um, Jessica, you have some, you have some thoughts I'd love to hear. Well, as you're talking, I'm, what you're saying made me think a lot about, I mean, I'm constantly re reflecting on like how I interact with my daughters around their media use and this piece of my and I know you'll get to this but like my role and sort of where did I not clearly set where do I maybe have different expectations than them in those mm -hmm. moments and that leads to a conflict right because I I'm yeah. said I'm saying it's time to get off but I didn't really prep them in that way and so their expectations were, were at a mismatch basically yes. um just like really interesting and then I but I, and I think all of these, and you know, our my dear families here, we um, are, like you can see how all of this also plays out in other areas of life. Just around, you know, my child, you know, we had a miscommunication, or they had certain expectations of something, and it didn't go a certain way, and there it leads to some sort of conflict or 
moment of anger, moment of where, you know, we're, we're arguing about something or like they're having maybe like a meltdown. They're feeling like they're, you know, out of control a little bit. And it's because there was like some sort of mismatch, right. Around what our expectations were or how we communicated something. Um, We see that play out, you know, outside of screen time as well, all the, all the time. Um, But anyways, I love that. I love this. um, I love this slide a lot. (laughs) Yeah, the the text heavy slide. Uh, I think the more that we can get to the root of the issue, you know, it's so easy to just address that moment. But we get to the root, then we can, I mean, I'm thinking of like a computer programmer, you can immediately, you know, the more times you can identify that, then the more conflicts that come up, you'll know, you'll know what it is, you know, you, you versus just dealing with that nuanced situation that might never come up again, but the root will come up again, you know, uh, and so I think um, and and these are just a, a few, right, that I pulled that are from my book. Um, you know, every family looks different. And so every family kind of thinks, well, okay, let's think about all the conflicts we've had in the past day, week, month. Uh, what, are, what are the common threads? Um, let's name them, let's identify them, and let's, you know, start discussing them there um, specifically is, is helpful. Uh, so you know, you you alluded to it a little bit. Um, we're gonna I'm gonna add a C, which which hasn't been done. The, the three C's have been around for a while, uh, but I think there is a fourth C to this this puzzle piece, and and that would be caregivers. Uh, as you may have noticed throughout the webinar, there were so many prompts that had you reflecting on your own media use, and so many times our child does something that makes us realize uh, they're always watching us and they're always soaking up what we do. And it starts at a young age. It starts with the baby smiling back at us for the first time, right? That's the first, um, maybe one of the first nearing moments you see. Um, but then they they repeat a phrase uh, that you say, uh, they repeat an action that you do. And then in, as they get older, it becomes more subtle. They pick up on moods, reactions, and habits, and they internalize them over time. And then all of a sudden we get older and we realize how many isms of our parents that we have, right? How many ways that you know we've kind of picked up on this. And I say all of that to say it's precisely the reason why your child's relationship with devices starts with your relationship with devices. Um, there, in 2015, there was a photographer, um, Eric Pickerskill, and he created a, a series called Removed. And it's a series of photos that he just took out the device. And his goal to show kind of how phone absorbed we are um, and how we've kind of ignored a lot of our surroundings because we get so sucked into our phone and we miss a lot of opportunities for human connection. And when I saw these photos, they really are uh, quite quite startling. And it really got me thinking about, you know, what moments look like this with my child? You know, how often does it feel like these photos from an outside perspective, right? And the inside perspective, no, 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 like I'm engaging with him, but I'm also doing a little bit of this and it feels okay. And then you look at it from the outside with, with this picture and it's like, whoo. And so, you know, how many moments do I have of these? And we call it technoference. That's kind of the official name. It's uh, used to describe kind of the active technology disrupting a moment. And research has shown us uh, that technoference has negative effects on parent-child relationships, child's mental health, and maladaptive technological behaviors. So um, a child, you know, starting to do cyberbullying or something like that. Um, and every time we break focus and check our devices, that's a moment of technoference. But <laughs> I'm not saying just don't let that happen again. Oh, good. Uh, we know how incredibly hard it is. The advice is, you know, take technoference and make it a teachable moment. Verbalize that, oh my goodness, I was just really distracted by my device and I didn't see what you were doing there or I wasn't able to listen to you as clearly. When you verbalize it, you make it a moment for them to to see why you found it problematic. Um, you know, we're we're all human here. We're all, I'm, I'm not advocating, I'm in the digital media, you know, line of business. I'm not advocating for no devices, um, but it goes back to intention. And if you didn't set intention, you find yourself on it in a moment that was supposed to be connection, just verbalizing that. You don't have to just chew it away and pretend it didn't happen. You know, use it as a moment um, to, to, to teach and to explain why that was, you know, um, why that was problematic or why you didn't like that. Um, so again, using your device as an opportunity and an invitation to talk about technology and create nuanced guidelines together that fit your family's needs and then 
be willing to be flexible, adapt them and actively reflect in the moment why it is or isn't working is going to be, it's going to be huge with this. It's not, not, you know, these rigid uh, rules, it's nuanced guidelines that will change and adapt. I want to go through now some, some tips and takeaways. We've talked about some of them, but just want to kind of hit you with the, the big ones here. Um, we just talked about the view and do strategy, right? What can you do after being on your device? How can you translate, extend, discuss, transfer the learning that you just had from your device? And how can you do it in the, the physical world? Um, my biggest one, which is often hard, is not using devices as a reward or a punishment. It is a tool. We said it in the beginning, it's just a tool. Use it as such. We don't take away scissors from a child or give them back as a reward or punishment unless it directly relates to it, right? <laughs> um, but I think that devices in the same way, a uh, sibling will have hit another sibling and will take away the device, but the device actually wasn't even involved in the moment. And the problem with that is it becomes a forbidden fruit that kids just want, 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 because I get it when I'm good and it gets taken away when I'm bad. And so I just want it. And so trying to neutralize it in your household and just thinking of it as a tool is, is really helpful. Keeping a, a mental note, or maybe you want to do a real tally of positive versus negative conversations around devices. We want to increase positive conversations and so that kids aren't conditioned to think they need to lie about their device or that anytime we talk about devices, it's a, it's a bad topic, it's a heated topic. Because especially as they get older, if let's say they see something on their device that they think is maybe not safe or right. We want them to be able to come to us and share that. But if from the get-go, whenever we talk about devices, it's bad, that's going to stay with them. And so really thinking about having positive conversations. What did you do? Did you see that funny video? I just finished up a study um, out of Erickson Institute about uh, where teenagers were sent text messages about a positive conversation they could have with their parent. And we saw really good results in that there was more conversation about technology. So if something was happening that the child should probably talk to their parent about, it was just more of a, a moment to discuss. The next one is letting your kids be bored, <laughs> let yourself be bored, encourage boredom over the default of just picking up a device. This is the biggest one I've been working on with myself and it's been challenging, but it's been really interesting to see um, kind of me fight it. When it comes to content, asking yourself who is driving that interactivity, you know, is it attention building or is it just attention grabbing? Uh, reduce the amount of watching that's on smaller devices. Try to do it, you know, be on devices in central rooms. And so instead of like locked away in their bedroom so that you can talk about it, you have a moment of connection um, so that it's, again, kind of going back to the days of you all did something together in the TV room watching or did a game on the, you know, hearkening back to the olden days of TV rooms. Um, setting intentions, again, are really helpful. You doing it and then having your children say what they're going to do on their device for how long. Nuanced guidelines instead of uniform uh, restrictions. And then uh, knowing your child, leaning into their interests and, and really focusing on that, trusting yourself as the expert in your child. Um, and then finding the root cause and modeling and practicing, having a relationship how you want your relationship to be with your devices and so that your kids can also have um, a healthy relationship with devices. Really quick to talk about Mightier. Uh, I do want to shout out Mightier for being, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it, um, being a fantastic example of high quality media for kids. Uh, it's kind of what drew me to the product in the first place. Um, when we talk about setting intention, these were just a few, and, and maybe Jessica, you'll have more to add on, but these were just a few that popped into my head when we think about when kids are using Mightier. Um, I, you know, them setting their intention, saying, I'm using Mightier to learn coping skills, explore my emotions, have fun, explore a new world, compete, calm down, take care of myself, be myself, practice strategies, have a safe space, feel joy. Um, I thought that there's there's a lot of really good in here and setting that intention helps helps you see that and kind of helps you place it then on your pyramid. I love this. This is really interesting also with, I, I think a lot of my dear kids have different perspectives on 
why they're, what my ear is, why they're playing, um, kind of like this range of their under understanding of, of what's happening and why they're doing it. Um, and this piece of setting intention to that, whatever that intention is yeah. for them is really interesting. Um, cause as and, a parent, it could be, you know, my intention for using my ear is mm-hmm. to learn coping skills. And the child says, my intention is to explore new world. Right. And that's okay. <laughs> that's, yeah. I mean, I think that's why it was made into the product it is, that it right. has levels. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just to quickly uh, just share on my book, if helpful for anybody, if you're interested in checking it out, um, it goes through a lot of what we discussed. It just has characters and silly puns and it's a little bit more uh, kid-friendly, I would say. So it's a children's chapter book that follows three characters uh, and they're on a mission to mediate their family's media use before the devices get get kind of checked out of the house. Um, it is intended for it when used in schools. Grades like two to five usually use it. Um, but again, you, you can know your your kids best. Um, we're gonna send out the curriculum link, which includes all of the lesson plans, uh, which have worksheets in them. You can do them easily at home. They're intended for teachers, but also the worksheets are. It just can be done alongside reading the book or in lieu of, you know, you don't have to read the book to do them. Um, I've also included the first five chapters as well, uh, which is in there, which will hopefully motivate you to go and buy it. Um, And then the book is is on Amazon if you search The Mediators and my name, Morgan Russo, or these links, um, which are available. um, And we'll share them out afterwards um, because, um, yeah, if, if the idea with this is having your kids read them. We, I've done a lot of book talks in school and having kids come up with these, you know, the, they're filling in their own pyramid and creating their own device game plan is, is empowering. Cause that's the goal. We want them to feel empowered to make choices that, that best, um, best fit them. So I'll, I'll keep this up here for a second. Um, I see, um, great. Thanks for, for sharing that resource, um, which includes then another link to the book. It's, um, and, and all the resources, which um, are free to download and free to share out as well, if you know of anyone else that might benefit from from this. Um, so yeah, we have about a little bit of time after if there are any questions that have rolled in. I'll say, I'll start talking as while we wait for some questions to come in, if anyone has them. Um, one question, Morgan, is the, so the book, would you suggest parents, like, it is a shared experience, parents and it, ch- children going through it together, or? It, I think it's best that way, yeah. <laughs> as I, most things are, but I also know the reality in which like, well, we don't really, you know, it can also be a book that the, the child reads and, and shares what they've learned with it. Um, mm-hmm. You can also kind of get the quick footnotes as the parent to to get an idea of what's being d- discussed um, in, the, in the summaries. But I think it's, yeah, it's best used as like, you know, let's use this book as a way to talk about devices, which feels a little bit strange. You could also mm-hmm. download it, I guess, as an ebook and read it on the device. But it's um, having, we talk about being proactive. Like this is a really great way to start to, you know, see what happens with one family um, when they go through kind of a right. an experience with their devices and then talk about it yourself. So um, the grade level hits right around like third grade from a from a reading standpoint. But I know that the, there's a second grade class that, that's used it. Um, I think a lot of the content's really beneficial. It doesn't cover social media. Again, social media is different <laughs> than just general digital media. And so I would recommend it second to fifth grade, though I do think even parents will get a lot from, from the book. So really any ages. Um, so yeah, it's, um, happy to answer any questions about it. I also included my email here too. If, if someone does have a question about something that um, I mentioned, or uh, just wants maybe wants that hard and fast rule that I I avoided uh, giving. Um, please reach out to me directly, and I'm I'm happy to discuss anything more specific to your family or your situation. Because um, I know with with families, everyone's looks different, and so routines and rules all look different. Um, but I do think while devices can often be an overwhelming topic to think about, um, the the second you kind of start to take a step back and realize, okay, these are tools. How do we want to use these tools in our families is, um, you know, it's a helpful way to kind of start that. Well, yeah, I know if um, we have any other questions, um, then I'm happy to answer and and stay on, but I think we're kind of, I don't know, 
if you have anything else. No, I think I think this is great. I'm just looking one. Uh, what is a comment came in? I don't think there's a question, but just um, this appreciation for the nuance aspect of what you're talking about. Um, I'm realizing that I don't, yeah, nothing. I think I'm the only one who can see <laughs> the questions and comments right now. Um, and yeah, just how applicable that is uh, to families' lives. So um, yeah, Morgan, I really, I, I learned a lot. I'm thinking very differently about a lot of things about myself. Um, about my children. Um, I think this is really wonderful. Um, and I think you've put together a lot of really useful resources um, that I'm excited to engage with as well um, and have available to our families. So yeah, I don't see any other questions coming in. Coming in. Um, we will, so the link to the uh, drive with the resources is in the chat. Um, we, this is recorded. So we, we're gonna put this up on the My Dear YouTube channel. I'll send out the link to everyone once that's done along with the resources again. And then um, Morgan, you're doing a, you're, you're doing one book giveaway, a raffle. Yes, so said, I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for me. So if you can uh, share with me, whoever yeah. is on that, then yeah, I will yeah. send them out your book. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for staying really with wonderful. us. Yeah, yeah. Thank you everyone. Thank you all.